Welcome, everybody. My name is Ken Kent. I'm the founder of Sign World 32 years ago. And uh, thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, we have four Sign World owners live on camera. And uh, we're going to let each one of them introduce themselves. And then uh, Jack Werner, who is our president and the current owner of Sign World, will give us a couple of comments. And then we'll open it up to questions. We like to go in the round robin fashion. So you ask a question, the panel will answer your question, and then we'll move on to the next guest and the next one. But trust me, folks, you'll have plenty of time to get all of your questions answered, plenty of time. And uh, if after you've asked a question, uh, a question and you're waiting patiently to ask again, if you want to put it into the chat box, uh, you can do that as well. So having said that, uh, let me introduce uh, first Larry Foster. Larry, give us a wave. Larry Foster is a sign world owner in Troy, Michigan. Larry, tell us about your business, please. You're on mute, Larry. Uh, the name of my business is Signs and More. We're located in Troy, Michigan, which is about 35 miles north of Detroit. I've been in business now for 19 years. Um, I'm in a building that is 8,000 square feet. Uh, started off in 1,700 squ square feet, moved to a building that was 4,000 square feet. And then about 10 years ago, I purchased uh, my own building, which is the 8,000 square foot building. Uh, this year, we'll probably do about $1.7 million in sales. We have 11 employees. Um, and then I guess uh, my background, I came out of retail. I worked for Kmart for 27 years. And when I left Kmart, I was the vice president of operations. And is it true, Larry, that you still have your first employee? It sure is. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, Jim Tardif, give us a wave, Jim, in the in the dark there. Uh, Jim, tell us about your business. So we are Signs of Significance. We're five years old. Uh, we are in Roswell, Georgia, which is a North Atlanta suburb. Uh, we're still in our original location. Here we've got about 2,500 square feet. I have myself and three employees. I uh, still have my first employee, Kevin, and uh, my son, Christian, joined us a year later after a year into our existence. Uh, what did I miss? That's signs of significance. We, we did buy a year into our existence. We, we bought another sign world shop, which was a couple miles up the street when that owner decided to retire. So we actually have two brands. Our main brand is obviously Signs of Significance, but we operate Apex Signs and Graphics as a second brand. Hey, thank you, Jim. Steve Cap, Steve, give us a wave. Tell us about your business. Happy to. Um, so we're about two and a half years old. Um, and uh, we started in the mid uh, 2018 timeframe. Uh, we're located in uh, Castle Rock, Colorado. Uh, it's a suburb of the Denver area. Um, and um, uh, we have right now about, uh, we have four, uh, four folks working for us, working on uh, getting a fifth. Uh, and uh, we're gonna do uh, north of 600,000 this year. Um, not exactly sure how much, but uh, we got a couple of deals in the pipeline that uh, could uh, push us beyond uh, beyond the 600,000 mark. So uh, I'm hedging my bet a little bit there. Um, okay. And uh, I, you know, previously I was a uh, director of IT uh, for Cisco Systems, um, and uh, uh, I was uh, I was uh, pushed out the door to retirement, which I wasn't ready for retirement. So I uh, uh, through a long course of uh, uh, a long road, I, I guess. Uh, I met Jack and uh, um, ultimately decided to come into Sign World and haven't regretted it since. Okay, well, thanks for being here. And last but not least, Jack Werner. Jack is the current president and the owner of Sign World. Go ahead, Jack. 
Uh, before I do, just back to Jim Turner for just a second. Jim, what was your career before? I spent 30 years with General Electric and then about three years as the global sales director for another company here in Atlanta called N3. Very good. So I'm Jack Werner. I was a sign roll owner myself for 10 years, joined in 1995 and ran it, my operation until 2005. Ran under the name 3D Signs after three of my boys, Dennis, Danny, and David. Started in 1,200 square feet with one employee, ended up in 5,000 square feet uh, with a staff of 11 doing about 1.3 million in sales the days before the internet when it was still yellow pages and we were more of a local banner shop then. We were not necessarily the, the big, more complex sign operations that we do today, and regional and national customers. Um, I, I sold that business then and joined Ken at the corporate office to learn his end of the business. And, Finished buying him out uh, just over six years ago. Uh, so now today when I answer questions, if it goes more to my experience running an operation, I'll speak from that perspective. If it goes more towards uh, training and policy and that, I'll speak from that perspective. So depending on the question, my answers might come from this side or that side. Okay. Well, let's get going. Brennan Palmeter, I uh, hope I pronounced it right. Brennan, uh, Go ahead. Do you have a question for us? Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, Brennan Palmer. You did great. Um, so uh, my question is, I, I kind of hear um, acquisitions and and, um, and things like that from from Jim. Um, guys, in your endeavors of maybe acquiring another business to grow, um, what kind of support did you receive from Sign World in in learning how to do that acquisition, or did you have previous experience on? how you took that acquisition. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, um, Sign World does a great job of, of training. They give you some business training, sign business training. Uh, and if you've got specific areas of, of questions, there's a, a team of 350 other Sign World owners out there that can help answer questions. Um, I had a little bit of acquisition experience from General Electric. Uh, the sign world owner was that um, sold his business to me was really like a mentor to me as I was starting out. He was, he was probably the closest other sign world shop to me. Uh, so he and I had a very strong relationship and he, he had a, a business broker approach me and we were able to work out a, a deal that I think was a win-win for both of us. Thank you, Jim. Jim. Jim, how long were you in business before that acquisition? Just a year. Just a year. Wow. Yep. Okay. Uh, Jack Warner, any uh, thoughts to add to that about uh, sign world owners who sold, uh, et cetera, et cetera? You know, being 32 years in business, we've got sign world owners that join us every year and sign world owners that retire out. We've had a couple retire out over the last month or two. Uh, most cases, they're selling it to a competitor in the market, as Jim was a competitor in the market for market share. Uh, we believe that there's other ways to grow the business. It's not, you don't, there's many ways to grow this business far and wide without having to acquire another sign company. Actually, Steve Camp might speak to that too. He bought another, bought one of his suppliers out and expanded that way. But Larry and others uh, grew the business without ever acquiring another sign company. So it can be done either way. Steve Cap, a couple of comments if you want. Yeah, I, I purchased uh, uh, a uh, retiring uh, sign uh, operation here in the Denver area and uh, integrated it into my operation. And um, I did that six months in. Um, and, um, you know, what it did to the business for me was uh, kind of grow me into different areas of the sign making business that I wasn't already in and also gave me a, a list of customers uh, that uh, uh, that I got into um, and it kind of exposed me to uh, other parts of um, of the industry hospitality and things like that that I was not already into so it, it did help my uh, operation grow um, and you know there were some uh, um, uh, challenges uh, with the acquisition. I mean, I, I learned a lot out of it. And if I ever do it again, I will, um, you know, be a lot smarter for it. But uh, 
um, you know, if you're, if you're ever thinking about making an acquisition, I would reach out to, you know, some of us, uh, Jim, myself, others that have gone through it and, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, know what you're getting into and, and how you would, uh, um, how you would, you know, cover your bets, if you will. Um, okay. Thanks, and, Steve. So Larry Foster, have you ever bought another sign company, had the opportunity experience? Uh, you know, I did have the opportunity. I didn't buy the business, but I bought their book of business. I, I bought their customer da database and all I did for a two year period, I gave them 10% of the proceeds if it was a profitable sale. W one worked out really well for me and the other one didn't turn out to be much. They just, their database wasn't good. Okay. Lori Young, Lori, go ahead with your question. What would you say your biggest challenge was when you all got started? And how quick did it start for you to get re re repeat business? Um, Lori, can you adjust your audio in any way and repeat that question again, please? Is that better? Much better. Okay. Uh, what was the biggest challenge when you all got started? And how quick did you all um, start getting re repeat business? Okay. Larry Foster, uh, Troy, Michigan. Um, how, what was the biggest challenge when you got started and how did you get the repeat business? Well, the biggest challenge when I got started was exactly that, finding those customers that have that appetite for signage that want to keep coming back over and over and over again. Um, you know, you, you, you get a lot of small customers and, and over a period of time, they do start coming back, but uh, you're always searching for those. And there's that 80-20 rule where you're going to get 80% of your business from your 20 customers. And it was like, I kept telling myself, that's just not going to happen. And I, I can't even tell you when it did, but one day I woke up and I figured out I'm getting 80% of my business from 20 customers. And now in my business, I have about 85 to 90% repeat business is my business. Okay. Jim Tardif, your thoughts. Um, how long did it take? I, well, start out with the biggest challenge. You know, my, my career with, with GE, I had very, very focused, very specific responsibilities. In this role, I have responsibility for all aspects of the business. So, so that was probably my biggest challenge, uh, was just wearing so many hats and, and, and making sure that I wasn't dropping any balls. My background was in sales. You'll find a lot of Sign World owners, I think, have an operations background coming in. So I, I've really not been challenged uh, by, by selling. It's more that operational challenge relative to getting repeat business. Uh, like Larry said, you we just start selling. We, we try to do a good job. We're looking as we continue to mature, we're looking for repeat type customers. And that continues, that base of business continues to grow for us. Uh, but we still have a lot of once and done, quote unquote, once and done. They're not truly that way, but once and done type customers. So we're always looking for the next new opportunity. Okay. Steve Cap, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, good business begets good business. And uh, you do a good job for a customer, they will come back. And that's what we've seen in our business. And uh, in fact, just yesterday, got a, a customer that we did some uh, work for up in the mountains uh, here in Colorado uh, two years ago. And uh, he just moved back into the country, wants to do more work with us again. And he says, hey, you're our sign guys. We want to, we even want to put you up on our website. So I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. So, okay. yeah, it's uh, kind of rewarding, I think, too, when you get repeat business. Jack Warner? I think there's two ways to look at challenges in the business. One is, you know, first you're trying to figure out what is a sign and who is the right customer, you're trying to sort that out. In the beginning, you're busy trying to get customers and you got to manage the projects. The other is, you know, as, as Jim said, he was strong on the sales and weak on the, on the operations, but the next person is going to be strong in the operation, weak on the sales. The next one's going to be great on everything, but weak on finance or weak on HR. So that's why you're joining an organization that has the help and support to help you shore that up and figure out and, and lean on the others in the system to get the help to 
make sure it's competent in all the parts of the business. Okay. Um, David Hardy, David, come off of mute. Uh, Go ahead, good David. Afternoon. Um, thank you for, uh, for hosting this and having me. Um, you guys have touched on this a little bit, but uh, given that many of you have come from different backgrounds and different industries, um, what kind of support did you receive from Sign World to develop your competencies uh, and develop success as a business owner in, in the sign uh, industry? Okay. To my panel of owners, uh, shorter answers, please. Um, I fear we may run out of time. Uh, we'll start with you, Steve Cap. We'll go backwards now uh, because you're the one that's most recently out of training. So what kind of support has Sign World given you since day one? Yeah, so um, first of all, the training itself is exceptional. It's uh, uh, some of the best training you're going to get and uh, really sets you, sets you off for uh, a good, you know, first step out into the industry. And then the reach back into, you know, Jack and into other folks in the organization has been um, really, uh, they've been there for us. Um, when we've had questions, we needed, uh, uh, you know, advice, uh, just some, you know, hey, what do I, what do you think about this uh, kind of scenario? They've been there to answer those kind of questions for us. Jim Tardif, your thoughts. Initially, you get two weeks of training. Uh, dedicated training with the sign world team beyond that um, there's ongoing training all the time there's 350 other owners that you can always reach out to uh, there's webinars going on every week consistently throughout the year so it's there's tremendous training and so Larry Foster if you can remember 19 years ago I can uh, you know lots of training up front um, Early, I think you, you lean on the technical training a lot. And then after that, it goes into maybe more of the, uh, the marketing type of training. But every year we have annual conventions, although in wacky 2020, it's uh, being held a little bit differently. But we get together for four days and just nonstop training for four days. And the, the owner support is absolutely fabulous. I mean, you just... You, you know who the, the strong owners are and you lean on them. Jack, would you maybe outline the current uh, training program for a new owner? So prior to opening, there's five weeks worth of training, which is enough to get you up and running and functional. There's a week of business training, a week of technical training, learning the equipment. You're then gonna do on the job training, working at seven different locations to learn how they each run their business and glean from their ideas. You're going to spend about 40 to 50 hours learning the business management software that runs the business. Then once you've hired your employee with our help, we'll help you with the interviews. Uh, we'll have a technician come out and spend three days on site and make sure you've got everything dialed in. From there, you're going to go into a two-year sales and marketing coaching program where you're on a video conference with about 20 other sign roll owners in the first two years, starting off with Ken in the beginner class, graduating to my advanced class. Uh, you join a mastermind group where you and uh, six to eight other owners are meeting weekly to discuss operational issues. We've got a blog site where only supposed post daily, where do I buy, how do I do, how do I price? And real answers coming, real life answers coming in from the other owners, real time. There's a calendar of live video conference, live so you can ask questions, not recorded, so you can't ask questions, but live on all the tough, different topics of the business from the supplier network to learning all the niches of the business to pricing to marketing to internet marketing you just got to look at the calendar there's virtually training of some sort almost every day for the rest of your life uh, as larry mentioned the convention every year and then as sign world owners are sharing projects with each other they're conversing with each other across state lines and etc to have coordinate projects and the biggest asset you're buying into is this culture of 350 other owners who are willing to help each other we built a, a cooperative atmosphere of, of peer support rather than a royalty paid top down support. Okay. Uh, James Moon. James, come off of mute. Go ahead. Go so ahead. One of the questions I would have or do have is early on when you were first starting, was there a point where you tried to overreach or go too far? And how do you, how do you curtail that and make sure you're starting off on the right foot and not overreaching. 
Larry Foster's smiling. Go ahead, Larry. You're first. <laughs> well, we, we all did that. I mean, everybody, you, you get into some jobs and you're out seeing the customer and, and they ask you about uh, the job that they, they need you to quote. And you say, absolutely, no problem. And you, get, you walk away from that customer and you have no way in hell of knowing how you're going to do that job. And that's where you rely on the other sign world owners. They'll help you with the job and they'll walk you through it and you'll get through it. You'll be amazed at what you can do that you didn't think you could do. Jim Tardiff. I was fortunate in the person that I hired initially, uh, Kevin, my designer and fabricator, um, had about 20 years of experience. One of our first conversations he told me, he said, Jim, you're going to go out you're selling all these signs and you're going to have customers ask you about signage that you, you won't know the answer to. Just say, yes, we can come back here and we'll figure out how to do it. And that's kind of how we've, we've proceeded. And just like Larry says, there's all kinds of resources within sign world and the team to help figure out how to get it done. And you do. Steve Cap. Yeah, I got to echo the other, uh, other two owners uh, comments there and uh, you know it kind of really emphasizes the point that you know the importance of hiring your your first uh, your first hire your first sign maker the uh, quality of that person is really uh, uh, very important and by the way I still have my first uh, sign maker here too so um, but uh, that's how good the guy is so uh, he bought me out of a lot of problems. Jack Warner. You know, while it's in some ways the challenge of the business early on, it's the blessing of the business long term. If these guys, if Larry been here almost 20 years, was doing the same thing that he did the day first day he started, I think he won't sell it. Uh, so it's it's that challenge, and it's that individual that likes to say, "Bring on a challenge," and we'll determine whether we want it or not. You can pick and choose your customers. Uh, you can turn away anything you don't want. So the limit of the business is you. Um, back to the first hire, uh, we sign world, we will help you find that person. We will interview them. We will test them. We'll send them down the street to work for another sign world owner to have them evaluated. Be, and then once you hire them, they can go to all of our training programs, no extra charge. So we're interested in you getting someone really good for your first employee, someone who's going to bring some life to the party. Michael Robinson. Michael, come off of mute. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, or good morning. <laughs> um, could you uh, explain the impact uh, COVID has had on your business? Larry, Rob Larry Foster, are business as usual, or do you have an uptick? Well, we... Yeah, we're we're loaded with business. You know, when it hit, I mean, it had an effect. I mean, your customers weren't operating, many of them. We we kept going. I, I at the time I had twelve employees. I let eight of them go to unemployment for a while. Four of us continued to work, and we provided signage to restaurants and some of the plants that needed to get ready to reopen. Um, we kept things moving during that time, so that when we came back. We weren't waiting for the business. We were ready to roll. So we, we came out of it okay. We're, uh, we're, we're going to have a good year. And all the employees are back? Oh, yeah. Everybody's back. Sure. They've been back. Okay. Great. Great. So you had a, a dip for what, a month or two? Yeah, two months. Yeah, two months. And then uh, the, the jobs that we had in the, the pipeline were able to continue. Okay, but now you have an uptick in business and see that you can meet your goal and see it. Yeah, I had a half a million dollars work in progress before COVID. It dipped uh, because we got a lot of stuff made. And then uh, we're back up over half a million and work in progress again. Okay, Jim Tardiff? Yeah, we, we hit a, uh, a lull. Uh, I, I've got three employees. I furloughed everybody for about seven weeks. Uh, I, I kept coming in, stayed heavily involved in all my networking to make sure everybody knew that we were still open. <clears throat> we weren't taking the larger project type business during that seven weeks. So we had a, a void from a cash flow perspective that had to work itself through the pipeline. We're through that now and um, 
the first the first three days of August, we exceeded our revenue for the whole month of July. So we're we're very busy now and looking forward to having a good strong year. Steve Cap. Yeah, we had a, a lull here in Colorado too, uh, about uh, early March until uh, roughly mid uh, mid May, uh, and then mid May it just took off like a, like a firestorm, and it hasn't stopped since. Um, so. Um, uh, we, we've actually um, uh, kept all our people working uh, during that time and uh, we did apply for a PPP loan uh, and we actually had another graphic artist that we pulled on board. Uh, so we actually were up uh, another employee during that time and kind of, if you will, doubled down uh, on the work that we were doing, a lot of it being deferred. And then when that stuff came in, we were able to pull it off the shelf basically and start executing it. And uh, so it was a worthwhile investment uh, on our part. Okay, Jack Warner. You know, I think by and large, uh, this is pretty standard from what most sign world loans would tell you. There was a dip. Uh, we all kind of took a pause and figure out where's the world gonna go. Uh, but sign world loans are busy. Some are very busy with COVID related things, whether it's distancing things or sneeze guards and. Others would say they haven't even had time to get to that because the regular business, the normal business, construction projects have got them buried. I think we're one of those industries that rides right through something like this. We've gone through many recessions and that, and signs keep moving. Okay. Sean and Michelle Hanson, come off of mute. Sean, go ahead. Good afternoon. So, um, as you start up your business, there's many different revenue streams, wraps indoor and outdoor signs, special one-off type projects. Can you talk to me a little bit about um, where your revenue streams were strong and where you had opportunity to grow those? Uh, is your question, Sean, focused on day one of the business or where they're at today? Yeah, I would say early on, first six months. Okay, okay. Larry Foster, what kind of stuff were you doing first six months? <laughs> Yeah, they're usually they're they're lower ticket. We did at the time a lot of banners, a lot of uh, corrugated plastic signs, things like that. But we also started right away. And uh, this is one of the things that just surprised me. We were starting early and in doing interior signage, the the ones when you walk into somebody's office that has the name of the company on the wall behind the reception desk. We did surprisingly well with that in the area that we were at. So those were kind of the big ones for us. Jim Tardiff, what was it like the first six months? What were you making? We were making anything that people wanted to buy from us at that point early on. You know, we were, we were just out selling and networking and just trying to get the brand name out there. And, and if there was a sign opportunity, we would take it. You know, people would ask, are you, what's your specialty? And I said, I, I don't know what the market needs are yet. I don't really, we were just in a learning growth mode at that point. Okay, uh, Steve Cap, what was uh, what were you selling the first six months? Uh, a lot of vinyl, a lot of banners, um, and uh, and we slowly, I would say, within the first month, got into channel letters and dimensionals uh, for lobby signs, and um, you know we uh, uh, we were kind of opportunistic in terms of what we took and and what we thought we could execute on, because at the time we only had you know, a sign maker and myself. So, um, but uh, yeah, that was largely what we did. And, uh, and then we kind of grew with, based on the, on the channel letters um, that just became a, a bigger part for us. Jack Horner. You know, the beauty of sign world, unlike the other options that each of you are looking at the franchises. In most of those cases, those other franchises, the product line and the customer base is very narrow, predefined, and you're hoping you like it. Whether you like it or not, that's what you get. In sign world, we're recommending start off a little bit more general and over the year or two, let a niche come to you. You're gonna be happier long-term because you practice with the customers, practice with the products in the beginning. It's a customer that has money with a product that's within reason that we can make because the equipment has quite a, quite a breadth of what it's capable of doing. Okay, Michelle Hansen. Michelle, do you have a question? Um, not at the moment. Okay. Dan, Dan Schultz, come off of mute, Dan. Good 
afternoon, everyone. Um, I actually had, in fact, I actually said it in, in the Q&A uh, portion of it. Um, again, it sounds like most of you, again, didn't have previous sign experience. I guess, what made you switch careers and why did you choose the sign industry first? And I guess, second, how difficult was it to learn the business and how quickly were you able to scale to an acceptable level? Larry Foster, what made you go into the sign business? And Well, when I left my corporate job, I, I knew I always wanted to go into business for myself and have my own company. And, and I looked at lots of different companies and uh, they were all franchises. And every one of them that I saw, I could see myself being successful. I saw good companies, clean companies, companies I could run. But I didn't feel like it was going to be mine. It was me running one small piece for somebody else. And after a while, one the guy said, well, there's another company out there. I've never done any business with them, but he explained what Sign World was about and uh, what the, the business opportunity was. And that worked for me. You give me the training up front, the vendor support, you train me, and then it's my company. And that's that's why I got into the sign business. Tim Tardis? So I was given the opportunity to retire after 30 years from GE. And I went for about three years with another company. And after that, my, my son had just graduated from college with an advertising degree. And he was looking for a career. And he and I decided we would try something together. We worked with a business coach. We looked at a lot of different opportunities. And Sign World was one of the, the opportunities we looked at. And we thought with Christian's advertising background, my business background, and my wife is a designer, a very creative person. Um, we just thought that the, that mesh fit very, very well with the Sign World model. And we, we like the creativity of it. You know, every, every deal is a new, a new opportunity for us. So it's a lot of fun. Dave Cap. Yeah, so um, very similar paths. Um, I, I uh, too worked with a career coach after uh, having gotten out of the corporate world for you know almost thirty six years uh, in doing a lot of federal government work, and uh, um, you know looked at a lot of different opportunities that were presented to me. And uh, um, you know, I, when I started looking at the mathematics of it, you know, I was like the design world business opportunity um, provided the best return on revenue out of all the other businesses out there, franchises, business opportunities, whatever, you know, you want to call them. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there was just an aspect of it that just appealed to me personally that said, you know, this looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. I've always wanted to own my own business. Um, you know, uh, and I jumped into it with both feet and then, uh, you know, it's been a good ride ever since. Jack Warner? You know, I made a list of 35 things that were important for me, both for what my day looked like, what the economics looked like, what my life around the business looked like. As I went back with my coach and looked at all the other options he was showing me, all of them got kicked out for multiple reasons. Yes, Simon will hit all 35. It just gave me everything I was looking for, from uh, close to home to a variety of customers to a variety of projects to seeing the results to uh, the economics to get there to having the freedom to do it my own way it was the best decision I ever made. Okay. Uh, once again, uh, may I remind my panel, we still have another 12, 13 people to go yet. So um, tighter answers, please. Hector Martinez. Hector, come off of mute. Hello, Hector. So my question, yes, thank you all. Um, my question is, uh, it kind of refers to a question that uh, was asked earlier, but how has your uh, business been affected uh, in comparison to the Great Recession now to COVID, if you had to compare the two? Larry Foster, you're talking the 08, 09 banking uh, recession, uh, Hector, I assume? Yes, sir. Okay, Larry, yes, sir. you lived through it. Yeah, uh, you know, the, honestly, they were kind of similar when uh, in 08, 09, and uh, the automotive companies were hit very, very hard. And my business in January of 09 really took a hit. And uh, 
we were down, I can remember we were down about uh, 40% that month. And then the next month that we were down 30, the next month down 20. And then we came back and we, we, we started to increase from that point. It, it's kind of a similar pattern with, with COVID. Um, looking back at it, I, I would say they were comparable. Okay. Jack Warner, you were around. What happened to you? Uh, you know, I think overall in sign world, we saw about a, a 10% dip. Signs ride right through a bad economy. If the business isn't making it, they're going to have going out of business sales. And they need signs for that. They're going to need to pay to have the sign taken down. And the landlord needs to put up a for lease sign. Somebody else says, I want that building. And they need a coming soon sign, a permanent sign, a grand opening sign. They realize signs aren't, uh, uh, the business isn't quite as good. And they need sales signs. Vehicles that are wrapped around a lease need to be recycled. Uh, businesses are still succeeding during this time. And we've got a lot of projects going on because businesses that are doing well during this. So it's one of those pretty recession resistant items that are out there. John Pollack, John, come off the mute. Go ahead, John. Hi, right, thank you. Um, Larry mentioned the 80-20 concept earlier. I was curious from all of you to hear uh, where you're getting your customers from and how do they fall into that? So in other words, uh, the 20% of your most valuable customers, how are you getting those customers? Hey, Larry Foster, tell us maybe about your top three customers, your top three repeats. How did you get them? Okay. What, um, do, you, what do you do for yeah. them? All right. Well, my actually last year, my number one customer was Dana Corporation, which is a, a tier one automotive supplier. And uh, we redid the signage in multiple plants, um, several in Michigan, some in Indiana, and down in Louisiana. And it was all the communication boards and the production boards and some pretty sophisticated stuff. They, they, I don't think they'll be my number one customer this year, but they were last year. Uh, my second one was a company called Pick and Pull. It's a, a, a chain of automotive junkyards. And they are located throughout the United States and Canada. They have the ugliest signs you've ever seen in your life. And I love them. Uh, they, they need signs every single day. And I'm getting orders from them. So those are my top two. Uh, how did you find the first customer? Or how did they find you, Dana Corporation? Dana Corporation is actually, it's a, there's a, a small maintenance company that is down the street from me. And they did maintenance for them. And uh, uh, I was introduced through them. Okay. And the second company, Pick and Pull? Pick and Pull was a uh, referral, and it was uh, uh, from a marketing company. They had the Pick and Pull account as far as their marketing, but they don't make anything. So they came to me. Larry, is it true that you make signs that say Ford Motor Company, General Motors, and Chrysler? Yes. Yep. Okay. Tim Tardif, top two customers, top three. How did you get them? What do you do for them? Um, we get the majority of our customers through our two websites, Signs of Significance and Apex Signs and Graphics, and through referrals uh, from the networking activities that I participate in. Uh, this year, one of our top customers is Kimberly Clark. They've got a large campus here in Roswell and we're redoing all of the external wayfinding signage around the campus. So that's one of our bigger projects. Um, other big repeat customers, I would say more gate openers potentially than, than customers are the uh, big commercial property management companies that we've developed a very strong relationship with. So every time they place a tenant in one of their properties, they're referring those tenants to us for all the signage. Um, so those are, those are probably the, the best customers from a repeat perspective that we have. So Kimberly Clark, a multi-million dollar worldwide company found you through the internet. That's correct. Okay. Steve Cap, beat that. <laughs> How about Mohawk Carpets? Okay. Uh, Mohawk uh, found us on the internet and you know to that point you know really 
the, the, the thing that folks really need to be aware of when you start this business is how you're marketing yourself and, and making sure that your name is getting out there and people see you. Uh, and I think a lot of the folks on here, you know, get a lot of their business through the internet. Um, and uh, that repeat business for, at least for, for me, is based on how well we treat those people and how well, um, you know, how satisfied they are at the end of it, whether they're gonna come back. Um, okay. And right now Mohawk is doing a lot of business with us. So Steve, not your repeat business, not your repeat business, but your new business. What percent of your new business comes from your website, from the internet? 90%. And Jim Tardiff, what percent of your new business, not your repeat business comes from the website internet? I would say 75 to 80. And Larry Foster, 20 years in, what percent of your, you said you have 85% repeat business. So the 15% of the new business, what percent of that comes from the website internet? 75%. Okay. Jack Warner, your thoughts? You know, I think the answer pretty well. I came from the Daisy Yellow Pages, but my largest customer came making the hours decal for one single subway location, but it turned into a $250,000 account by grabbing from that, getting to the regional uh, director for subway. And I've got a couple of slideshows I'm going to show in the background. There's no audio to them. We're going to continue with questions while they go on. The first slideshow, just showing in some of the facilities inside and out so you can see what operations look like, each unique and different. The second one is kind of showing you what is assigned, both what we make in-house and what we outsource, and then showing you unusual signs you wouldn't even think of as a sign. The third, third slideshow shows you our wall of fame, projects that sign over this. Go ahead and start continuing questions, Ken. Okay, Dale Kim. Dale, come off of mute. Hello, Dale. Dale Kim. Yep, sorry about that. Go ahead. Getting off of mute. Go ahead. Yes, um, go ahead. Can you uh, just share uh, maybe your, I guess each of you, your initial break even point after you got started? Uh, was that a few months in or is that a couple of years in? Okay. Um, Steve Cap, how many months were you in business before you broke even cash on cash on a monthly basis? Four months. And how many months before you took your first paycheck? Seven. Okay. And Jim Tardiff, how many months were you in business before you broke even cash on cash? Three months. And how many months before you took your first paycheck? Uh, me, it was probably 10 months, but then again, I was, I was reinvesting in, in the business. Okay. Larry Foster, how many months were you in business before you broke even cash on cash? Four. And first paycheck? Five. And uh, Jack Warner? Uh, first month in business to uh, cash positive, six months to paycheck. Our average is five months to cash positive. Okay. Kyle, Kyle, come off of mute. Hello, Kyle. Kyle, are you there? Come off of mute. Grace Lewis, Grace, come off of mute. Go ahead, Sorry, Grace. It's actually, it's actually Frank. Grace is my, using my daughter's laptop, so... Um, I guess my question would be, there's, you know, there would appear to be a lot of printers, a lot of sign companies out there. Um, what is it that differentiates your businesses from everybody else um, to, to get that piece of that business that quick? Larry Foster, what makes you different than all those? How many other sign companies are around you, Larry, and what makes you different? Oh, uh, I think there's probably 10 now. Oh, well, that's just sign worlds. And then uh, no, there's sign company. Sign companies, there's 200 in a 20 mile radius. And why are you, uh, what are you, you different? Know, why are you different? Why are you better? Well, gosh, it's, it's, it sounds so, you're going to hear it from everybody. If you just got to do what you say you're going to do. If you go and see a customer and you tell them you're going to have a quote in 24 hours, that quote's got to be on their desk 24 hours, no later. If you get the job and you tell them it's going to take seven days, seven days from now, you got to have the job done. And if you do that, you're going to have all the business that you can handle. 
Okay, Jim Tardiff, your thoughts. I would say the differentiators for me are response time and creativity in our designs. We get a lot Steve of feedback from our clients that, uh, that our team is able to come up with designs that nobody else is able to come up with. So, Steve Cap. Well, you know, execution definitely, um, but also, you know, upfront uh, having a consult consultative attitude, you know, with your customer to help understand what their needs are and and be able to set expectations with them that you're going to deliver to them what they expect. Jack Horner, your thoughts? From what these owners are telling you, that sounds like normal business. However, most of our competition is not owned by a business person. It's owned by a former sign maker, more of a single task person who saved up nickels to buy his own equipment, now trying to juggle 20, 50, 100 projects and it's chaos for them. So our professionalism compared to their ineptness is our biggest advantage. Okay. Dave uh, Scotto, Dave, come off the mute. Thanks, Ken. Go ahead. Yes, um, I'm about 30 days away from kind of pulling the trigger on this, and I just wondered what were the things that you guys, what was the one thing in that last 30 days that you guys kind of helped set you up for success? Uh, you mean 30 days before they made the decision to join Sign World? Uh, what was what yeah. triggered their triggered them to go ahead? Okay. Larry Foster, before you pulled the trigger to join Sign World, what was the last thing that caused you to pull the trigger? Well, I, I mentioned it earlier. I, I saw all those franchises out there, but it just wasn't my company. It was me running a small piece for a larger company. And so Sign World fit the bill. It was, it was my company, and that's, it was easy at that point. Jim Tardiff? And we looked at Sign World, once we, once we kind of focused in on signs, we looked at Sign World, we looked at the big franchises. I just couldn't stomach the idea of paying a royalty forever uh, to, the, to the franchise. And Sign World gave me that freedom and flexibility to, to get the job done, like Larry was saying, with my own company. Steve Cap. Yeah, I, I, you know, for me, I had been uh, kind of, you know, drifting a while um, without a paycheck. And uh, I was anxious to get back to work to, you know, doing something that was going to, um, you know, help me pay for my kids' college and stuff. And, you know, and I, in addition to owning my own business and doing something that I, I think I was really going to enjoy. So that was a big motivator for me. Okay. And uh, Jack? You know, you've got to do your homework and the validation talk to the sign rule lawyers. Then it's having a meeting with yourself and believing in yourself. And if you believe in yourself and you follow the plan, the system works. So sometimes it's at some point, get out of your way and believe in yourself. Brian, Brian, come off of mute. Tell us your last name, Brian. Hello, Brian. How about Sven Herbal? Sven, come off of mute. Go ahead. I don't have a question at this moment. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks for joining. Joe Norris. Joe, come off of mute. Go yes, ahead, sir. Joe. Yes, sir. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I apologize for being late to the call. Uh, uh, if this question's already been asked, just let me know. <laughs> uh, but could you, um, could you describe um, your first day with the doors open? Uh, versus today and kind of contrast those two, how your day changed from day one to now. Okay, Larry Foster, how many days a week do you play golf? <clears throat> Normally three, this week four. During the week? Three. Okay, and w how about the rest of your day or days? What are they like? <laughs> well, you know, they changed a little bit. I, I mean, I'm pretty structured in the morning we have an eight o'clock meeting with the organization um, then we make any outgoing phone calls that I need to make in the morning I go between 10 and 2 and try to make uh, as many appointments as I can uh, or see existing customers during that time 
in the afternoon, I tried to go uh, um, uh, come back and write up the jobs that I saw, make any outgoing calls, and then some accounting stuff at the end of the day, and we're done at 4 o'clock. It, it's changed a little bit. You know, we're not out as often as I would like. Uh, you know, more of the stuff is done on the Internet. So I would say instead of 10 to 2 booked, um, it's a, more of a casual 10 to 2. You know, we'll probably just have two or three appointments during that time. So with all the golf, Larry, you're working about 20 hours a week. I work more than that. I uh, I golf early and I golf in the afternoon. So I'm I'm getting 35 hours in. Okay. Uh, Jim Tardiff, what's your life like today? I aspire to be like Larry. Uh, I'm, still, <laughs> I'm still working a lot of a lot of hours. You know, we're we're still growing. We're a relatively small team. I'm wearing a lot of hats still, but uh, I've got a passion for for making this business work. You know, we're handing it over to my son uh, so he can have a career out of it, and we're just focused on growing the business. Are you having fun? Yep. Okay, Steve Cap, where are you at? Um, well, I'm still working a pretty full week. Um, I try to reserve my weekends uh, uh, where it's all po at all possible. Um, but, uh, um, you know, eventually we're going to get to a critical mass point where I'll be able to, you know, be like Larry. Okay. Jack Warner? You know, when I ran my business, I prided myself that I was on Little League Field at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, four days a week, and then my boys' teams. The business where if you're head of your customers and staff, you can have a life. Uh, but I think it's 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 one of those businesses that you've got to figure out how you want it, want to position. And early on, you're building relationships with customers. Long term, you're nurturing the relationships. I met with my top ten customers each probably once a week because we had multiple projects going on and discussing the next project. So. Folks, if you, those of you who have already had a chance to ask a question, if you have more questions, uh, could you type them into the Q&A chat at the bottom on the right? And the person who is a 770 area code 905, uh, would you like to ask a question? Is there anybody that I missed? Anybody that has not had a chance to ask a question? Please come off a of mute, say hello, introduce yourself. Did I miss anybody? Okay, we got a Q&A at the bottom here uh, from uh, Brennan. Uh, how do you decide what to pay yourself as an owner? Um, my simple answer is everything that's left over at the end of the year, but Larry Foster, Tell us how you pay yourself, or how do you decide what to pay yourself? Well, I take a I take a consistent draw every two weeks. Uh, I pay myself quarterly bonuses, um, and then there is that at the end of the year. Um, you know how much money did the company make, and whatever the company make it made is what I made. So I may take an additional bonus. I put it in. I put a lot of money into my four hundred one k. Uh, and that, that is done throughout the year, but it's certainly at the end of the year, I take a big chunk and it goes in the 401k. And then the other thing you always want to consider, you want to leave money in the company as well, because you want equipment purchases in the future. And so you, I don't take it all out. Jim Tardiff, how do you decide what to pay yourself? Uh, I decide what to pay myself really very similar to what Larry was saying. Um, it, a lot of it depends on, on where we are financially. I fortunately have some flexibility uh, in what I do take and what I need to take. Uh, and we, as I've mentioned before, we reinvest in the company to, to help the company continue to grow. Steve Kapp? Yeah, my wife tells me what she wants and that's what she gets. Jack Werner? I think Steve won the award. I, I uh, you know, you, you need to pay yourself a paycheck regularly. And then, as Larry said, uh, everything else gets bonus out to you at the end. Okay. Uh, Jim, James Moon asks, uh, most customers uh, give you the artwork. But the uh, question is, how do you keep the graphic artists from getting bored? 
Uh, we'll let you start out with that, Jim Tardif, since it seems like you do a lot of design work, um, maybe more than others do. Go ahead, uh, Jim. Yeah, what, what, what I've learned is a lot of customers come in with some work from a graphic artist, and there are some very distinct differences between graphic arts and sign design. So that at a lot of times it takes some tweaking, but probably the best projects we have are when people come in with some ideas of what they'd like and they'll sit down with, a, uh, with our team in a design consultation and we'll brainstorm. And then it's up to us and, and my team to come up with some ideas that we can present to those clients and it, it just works out tremendously well for us. Jim, uh, maybe to clarify for everybody, are you creating people's logos uh, and creating some of this artwork from scratch, or are you taking what they already have, their logo, what they want to say, and then glamorizing that, making it look nice and better? Yeah, it's, it's a combination. We, in fact, do have clients that come in that are startups, don't have a logo yet, and we will help them design logos. Um, if it's, for example, a, a vehicle graphic, um, they've got some vision, some what they would like, and they'll sit down and explain that to us and, and we'll interpret that and, and our team does a great job of being able to present ideas through proofs uh, to our clients that, that just have that vision, that, that thought. So Very Foster. From, from no idea right on through coming in with, with a full set of graphics that we, we produce for okay. Larry Foster, what do you do? Well, you know, my graphic artists do more than just do graphics. I have one right now on a Zoom call with a national chain of, uh, called Crunch Fitness, and we are going to be the um, their sign supplier for all of the eastern part of the United States. It's going to be a huge account. She's, she's on that Zoom call with my general manager talking to their corporate people right now. Um, I have my, my designers also will go out with me and see customers so that they can see things firsthand. So we try to give them some variety. They're, they're, they're designers, they're project managers, they're totally involved with their customers. Steve Kapp? Yeah, I think I'm a little bit more like Larry in that regard. Um, um, but we've also learned some techniques too that when customers come to us without artwork that we can that we can work with, we have uh, found websites that will do conversions for us to to the vector art format that we need to run our machines on. So um, we're not limited by you know just what we have what we can do from an art standpoint. We're we're trying to include the customer in that, regardless of what kind of format of material we get from them. And 90% uh, of the time we can make that work. Jack Warner? You're really in the manipulation business, blow up business, and you are in the true art creation business. The customer already has your logo in most cases. There'll be some where you're gonna do your own or do a new one. Uh, some companies are gonna have everything and you're strictly producing, but the bottom line is your staff has the capabilities to do it from one to the other. Uh, your talents are not there to be the artistic person. You're there to uh, relationship building and uh, project management, letting the staff take care of the artistic side. Okay, question from Brian. How long were you in business before you upgraded your equipment, Larry Foster? Other than some nominal tools and so on, how long before you spent any money on your next big piece of equipment? Five years. Jim Tardif, how many years? Uh, we have not made a, another major investment yet. We're five years old. We're looking at it now. Okay. Steve Cap. Well, we made uh, a major investment in equipment when we purchased uh, uh, the retiring sign company that I mentioned earlier. And then um, just in the last, uh, in the last month here, we've uh, uh, acquired a, a new flatbed uh, UV printer and a CNC uh, routing machine. So we've added quite a bit in the last month. Okay. But you could justify it with the cash flow of your business. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Jack Warner? I was about three years in before I started bringing more equipment. Okay. 
Uh, Brennan asks, is anyone expanding into digital marketing? Uh, Brennan, uh, I hope your definition is the same as mine, but when you say digital marketing, we're talking about television like monitors that may display one message or multiple messages. And do we sell them? Larry Foster? I don't do a lot in that business. We usually, you know, we'll do one or two a year. Uh, we do some for schools and, and we did one for a church, but it's, it's, for us, it's not a big part of our business. Jim Tardiff? Yeah, I would say the same with Larry. It's not a huge part of our business. A lot of our cities don't allow external uh, moving signs or those types of signs. We have done some projects, but it's not a big piece of our business. Steve Cap. So we don't do the TV thing, but we do um, LED digital panels. Uh, um, the, the actual digital sign that you'll see throughout, uh, you know, different kinds of um, um, businesses that uh, have a, a dynamic uh, uh, kind of signage. And uh, we've done um, we've done one this year, and we expect to do at least three more this year. Jack Warner. You know, you can have a very successful business doing it, a very successful business doing it without. Digital signage is a big business, but yet it's, an, it's, a, it's a drop in the whole scheme of the whole sign industry. Okay. Uh, once again, gross sales and profit. Larry Foster, your projected gross sales for this year? 1.7 million. And historically, Larry, what was your net profit, your net cash flow to the owner percentage? <laughs> No, right around 25%. Okay. Jim Tardiff, projected gross sales this year? We had projected a half a million. We'll be a little off of that due to COVID, but our, our margin rates are about 25%. And Steve Cap, projected gross sales? Between 650 and 700,000 this year, about 25%. Jack Werner? I. Uh, 25% is what you're going to find as industry standard. Okay. Uh, the next question from Jim Moon, I think we answered that as far as uh, artwork and idea graphs to display information instructions that come from the customer. Yeah, we, we do that. Uh, Brian asks, I've noticed closing times during the week varies. Do any of you see value in open on the weekends? Larry Foster, have you ever, ever had weekend hours? Um, Politely, I would say, hell no. <laughs> Jim Tardiff, have you ever had weekend hours? We have not. I've worked on weekends, but we don't have weekend hours. And Steve Cap? Yeah, we don't have weekend hours either, but we have worked on weekends due to workload. Jack Werner, do you know of any of the 350 sign world owners who have weekend hours? You the business that's a Monday through Friday business. Uh, your companies don't, customers don't expect to be open. Ken, I am going to have to break away. I've got it. We have seven new operations and new owner training. I've got to get into the new owner training room. So I'm going to let you. Finish. Okay. Okay. We got one more question and then we're going to say goodbye from Michael Robinson. How did you finance your startup and how did you sustain yourself until you could afford to take a paycheck? Larry Foster. Um, I was fortunate. I was able to pay cash for the business. Um, and then uh, I had a settlement from the company that I left. So uh, there was no immediate need, but I, I only had to wait five months. So it, it wasn't too bad for me. Jim Tardiff, how did you finance your startup? I also financed it out of my personal uh, investments. And I was fortunate enough when I left GE to get an early retirement. So they're paying me attention. Steve Cap, how did you finance your startup? Out of my retirement. So your 401k plan? Yes, good. And, uh, and how did you sustain yourself before you took a paycheck? Also the retirement? Uh, out of my retirement, yeah. Okay. So uh, for everybody's knowledge that uh, in the past several years, uh, probably 90% of all new sign world owners use their 401k IRA pension plan money. Uh, and the 10% that do not either did not have a 401k uh, pension plan, uh, but they wish that they did. 
So that is by far the most popular way to go. Also, if you would talk to your business coach, your business broker, they probably will tell you the same thing, that if they're doing business with a hundred different franchises, that probably 90% of all the deals they do, the uh, new owner uh, finances through their IRA pension plan. Folks, we're out of time. Our uh, panelists need to get back to work. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, it's been a great experience. Uh, this Friday, we have a virtual discovery day that starts at 7.45 a.m. Pacific time and lasts till about 3 o'clock, 3.30 Pacific time. During that day, you'll go face to face with eight, eight different sign world owners. We'll take you on a tour of three locations. If you're not already signed up and you'd like to come, please uh, uh, let Jack Werner, Dan Werner, or myself know, and we'll put you on the schedule. But it's this Friday. 7.45 a.m. Pacific time till about 3 or 3.30 Pacific time. Uh, three uh, tours of locations, uh, a website internet presentation that you'll find fantastic, and an equipment demonstration. And again, eight different owners that you can ask them anything you want to ask. Them. Larry Foster, thank you for being with us. Jim Tardiff, we thank you so much. Steve Cap, thank you. Uh, it's been great. And to all of our attendees, thanks for joining us. Have a great day. See you later. Bye-bye. Take care.